Hi, welcome to chapter six, controls. You might be wondering what is, what is the reason for naming a chapter controls? I also wondered quite a bit, but we will find out at the end of this chapter. In a sense, we're gonna learn about various techniques in this chapter on how we can do causal inference when we cannot run an experiment. That's it. And there are various mechanisms. Observational study, which depends on this uh, concept of conditional ignorability. You're gonna find out what is linear treatment effects, high dimensional confounder adjustments, heterogeneous treatment effects, propensity models, sample splitting, and synthetic controls. We're gonna learn about a lot of these concepts and they're all gonna to fit together. And so stay tuned till the very end. But if I were to summarize this entire chapter in one line, or maybe two lines, the first line would be, when you cannot run an A-B test, when you cannot run an A-B test, we need observational study as a tool set to do causal inference. So if you want to use observational study, what we need is we need to be able to control for variables that impact the treatment assignment and outcome variable, the response variable. And that is the role of controls in observational study. So now you get it. Why is this chapter called controls, right? Controls is being able to control for the type of variables that impact the treatment and the outcome. So what is this in essence? Observational study is trying to mimic an experiment, right? When you are able to control for all variables that impact your treatment and your outcome, then you can find out a causal link. And that in a sense, an experiment does exactly that. An A-B test does exactly that. So if you think about this, observational study helps us mimic an experiment when you cannot run an experiment and you still want to do a causal inference. So that's when you need observational study. And for us to mimic an A-B test, this is the heart of an A-B test. It's able to control for variables that impact your treatment, treatment assignment, and even outcome. And then you can actually do the difference between what was the causal link of this treatment on your response. So that's the role of a control. A role of a control, an efficient control, is one that can help us with running an A-B test. And so when we cannot run an A-B test, we wanna mimic everything that the A-B test does. Yeah, so that's why this chapter is called controls. So we're gonna find out various mechanisms and techniques now as to how to run and understand controls and how to run an experiment. So you might be understanding like, hey, when we, what is an example of when we cannot run an A-B test, right? So let's get into that. So when do we need an observational study and what is conditional ignor ignorability? So an example is like, let's say you're trying to make a business decision and you have data from the past and you're trying to use that data from the past to make future decisions. Well, you can't go back into their past and run an experiment, right? You just have past data. You're gonna use past data that you might not have run experiments on, but you might know what was the impact of, or what was the trend like in sales growth when certain decisions were made, right? So you only know things in the past, then that's an example of when you cannot run an A-B test. Something in the past is what you need to use to make decisions for the future, that's an example. The second example is, let's say you're trying to find out how much wage hike you should give to your employees. You can't run legally an experiment when you, run, when you discriminate using wage for various gender or protected classes. That's just not possible. Legally, you cannot run such experiments. So that's another example where an observational study is useful, where you can't run that A-B test, you cannot run an experiment, or you are stuck with the data that you have from the past to make decisions for the future. And the decisions that you make for the future need to have a causal link. And so that's where you need some sort of uh, counterfactual analysis, um, which tells you what is, what is the treatment or what's the action you should take 
for your business to actually make a forward, um, forward, forward progress towards whatever you're trying to do, right? So those are examples. This is where you need observational study. Make sense intuitively? So now, if you can't run an A-B test, we'd have to mimic, or we have to get as close to running an A-B test. And so that's where conditional ignorability concept is useful because that is that is the heart of an A-B test. So what is conditional ignorability? Conditional ignorability is the assumption of, which has to be true for you to say, hey, I have a causal link using observational study. So observational study depends on this assumption of conditional ignorability. And what is that? Conditional ignor ignorability says that it assumes, conditional ignorability assumes that you have tracked and can control all confounding co-influences controls on both your treatment variable D and your outcome variable Y. What does that mean? That means that even though you can't run an A-B test, you have tracked all confounding, so this is the key, all confounding variables, all variables that influence your treatment, your treatment selection, your outcome, and your response, right? Whatever outcome such response. So it just assumes that you are able to look at your data and be able to control for all such variables. So that's the big assumption. So that's a very strong assumption, right? Um, because it just assumes that you can, you can actually do what an A-B test does. That is the conditional ignorability test. And so now, now this, all, and this, this process of choosing the, the variables, right, the control variables, is, is very subjective. You can say, hey, someone can say, I, I, I have chosen five um, confounding control variables, but you know, someone else can say, oh, five is two less, you should have picked the sixth and the seventh, or you should have at least 50, or five is just too much, it's not needed. So it's very subjective. So who decides whether you have actually met conditional ignorability? So it's just a very strong assumption. That's the key to take away from this, right? Which is, it's very hard to prove that you have indeed control for all factors that impact your treatment and your outcome, right? And so, for example, right, like mother's age, uh, it's one control variable. And you have a treatment that you want to look at smokers, these are all the blue dots, and non-smokers, the green dots. And now you want to find out the impact of this treatment on the outcome variable, the birth weight of your child, right? You could say, hey, I have control for mother's age, I have this control in place that impacts both my treatment and my child's, you know, the child's birth weight. But there could be 50 such variables. How do you know you've actually chosen all the control variables that impact and are confounding to both your treatment and your outcome? So that's the test of conditional ignorability. That's the basis, that's the foundation uh, for observational study. So again, the thing to take out of this is that causal inference without experiments is just hard. Because there's lots of subjectivity involved if you don't have an experiment, yeah? Because for you to say, hey, this is the treatment effect, it assumes that you have control for all such things, all such variables like mother's age and others to actually find out that, hey, this is, this is the effect of non-smoking, not smoking on the birth weight of the child. It's just hard. All right, so now we understand that there are three types of variables from this diagram, right? There's a control variable, which is mother's age, treatment variable, smoking, non-smoking, and outcome variable, the birth weight of the child. You could say the mother's age directly impacts child's birth. You could see that in the trend. You could see smoking, non-smoking directly impacts child's birth. So there are many such variables. So in essence, we need to be able to control for so conditional ignorability says we need, we need controls or variables that we can control for uh, things like mother's age, which are control variables that impact the treatment variables, smoking, non-smoking, and the outcome variable, child's birth. Remember, yeah? So that's the essence. It's an example. But remember, treatment assignment is not equals treatment, right? So we are thinking about variables that impact both the treatment assignment and the treatment. All right.
so far so clear now let's look at how we can in a practical sense model conditional ignorability for that we use linear treatment effects it's one way so treatment effects basically refers to a given treatment or intervention has an impact on the outcome variable of interest right the birth weight of the child so that's treatment effect if you give a treatment someone smoking non-smoking is a treatment what's the impact on the outcome variable right or another example if you administer a drug give a treatment what's the impact on the health of the patient right so treatment effect in a sense refers to the causal effect of a binary variable assigning treatment smoking yes non-smoking no not assigning a treatment non-smoking on outcome variables birth weight right so what's the impact of a treatment variable binary smoke non-smoke on the outcome variable birth of the child so we know this would be treatment effects as long as we have control for all control variables so treatment effect is this delta this gap between this this regression and this regression right so that's treatment effects that's linear you're just assuming linear model for this and so then how do you adjust with high dimensional con confounders let's say you have like you know in this we just assume one dimension mother's age there could be 50 such variables that could impact the birth weight of the child so how do you do that well you do that if you have several confounders or several control variables that impact both your treatment assignment and treatment and your outcome the way you do that is you use uh, regularization techniques that we have studied in the past if you remember chapter 3 part 2 video I've gone through that in various regularization technique go back and revisit that if you don't remember but in a sense what we're trying to do is with regularization techniques we're trying to reduce the number of covariants or number of confounders um, using techniques like lasso regression ridge regression least square regression so algorithm six is when we covered various techniques in which we can actually find out the variables that have the biggest impact and that that we really need to use as part of controls so once we found out that fewer number of such predictors or variables that really need to be part of uh, your controls all you do is you simply control for them by adding that variable as part of your regression so you make it an explicit um, independent variable part of your uh, regression equation so you say hey if you find out mother's age is important using lasso regularization you add that as a depend you know you fit that and you use uh, that variable as part of an explicit uh, control as part of an explicit independent variable that predicts the birth weight of your child so you keep adding such variables and find out the ones that are you know the few that are the most important so you're actually reducing complexity by doing that so linear treatment effects lasso is the new algorithm in a sense finding out the few number of covariants that actually impact using regularization techniques and then having an explicit dependency on those variables to find out the impact of those uh, on your outcome and now what is heterogeneous treatment effect we talked about linear treatment effect right uh, in the previous slide and now there is heterogeneous treatment effect the concept here is that we can't just average out and say hey smokers non-smokers is a linear and there's a difference is 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 that but every person who's smoking or non-smoking could have a different response you saw various dots in there right so this phenomena where there could be a different response based on the subject or the individual that's being treated is what's captured by this higher order concept of heterogeneous treatment effects as to what are what are those uh, predictors that are different for different individual or different subjects so modern tools in machine learning allow us to not just look at average treatment effects or linear treatment effects but make it even easier to use heterogeneous treatment effects so you can find out for various cohorts what is the impact and one such example is missing data right you could um, you could handle missing data by either 
adding uh, zeros or means, right? And that can have an impact too, right? But there could be various categories of people within, within, this, uh, within this cohort, right? Within this green cohort, there could be various categories of people which could have its own prediction. There could be a subgroup here and which could be very different than the subgroup here, not just mother's age, uh, where, where there's a linear rise. So you could think about this as not an average effect or a linear effect that's shown here, but that could be an effect that is dependent on the cohort itself. So that is a, being able to model for that is what um, we can do with heterogeneous treatment effects. So an example of linear treatment effects that we just covered is propensity models, so various types of propensity models that we use in real life. So for example, what's the propensity for someone to buy Let's say you are Zillow and you see someone actually on your website on a specific home that they're really interested. You might want to buy, you, want, you might want to have a, a model that predicts what's the propensity for them to actually make an offer or buy this home. Or you might have a customer that's happy on your website, like let's say Netflix, and you want to predict what's the propensity that this person will actually leave. You can do this with linear treatment effects propensity to buy, Netflix, propensity, uh, to, propensity to buy, Zillow, propensity to churn, Netflix, where you have a recurring customer, propensity to engage, you wanna sell something, ads, right? Google, this is one such example, customer lifetime value. There's so many such propensity models that you can build using linear treatment effects and heterogeneous treatment effects. And think about this, right? how your customer engages and how you model for your propensity for your customer depends on so many things. How your customers learn, that's one treatment effect, right? Learn about your products, how they you know, switch, what channels they use to switch your, from your products, right? Like, um, and there's so many things that go into a decision making on how the demand for your goods and services change. And so that's what this heterogeneous treatment effect is trying to model. Because your demand changes based on how your customers learn, what kind of channels they use to learn about your product, how they switch, how easy they are to switching to newer products and trying new things. Um, and so there are various factors. It's not just one, like smoking, non-smoking. Within smoking, non-smoking, there could be several other aspects like income, Right. Similarly, for your customers, it could be what kind of age they are, what kind of gender they have, what uh, what do they prefer, not prefer, what what is it that, you know, where do they live? There's so many factors. And so that is heterogeneous treatment effects that you can model. So that's an example of a concrete example of four different companies, how you can actually model for this and use this in real life. And so then we have sample splitting and orthogonal machine learning, which is algorithm 15. So linear treatment effects, average treatment effects, or heterogeneous treatment effects gives us point estimates, right? So we can't use uh, inferential properties like, hey, what's the standard error like you get from ordinary least square? So the solution to this is sample splitting, right? So what we do is we use our data sample um, and then we split that sample into various uh, samples, subsamples, um, and we use various uh, advanced techniques in orthogonal machine learning, which provides us to do this sample splitting in an orthogonal set. And then what do you do? You use model selection on the first sample, use the first sample to do your model selection and use inference from the selected model on the second sample. This is a simplistic way of saying what is orthogonal machine learning, right? And that gives you various inferential properties like standard errors and others that you can use based on how your model does in inference for the sample too. So that's how you can use sample splitting as a technique to actually get inferential properties, right? Final topic, synthetic controls. So when do you need synthetic controls? So let's say you have as a company made a decision to introduce, um, I have an example here, or let's say, let's start with the first example, Sweden. Sweden decides, hey, I want to introduce carbon tax 
and then they do it. And then 50 years later, someone does a study saying, hey, introducing carbon tax, what was the impact of introducing carbon tax in Sweden in 1990 on gasoline consumption? So that's something that you, can, you can't run an A-B test because there's something in the past. That's one example. The second example is like, let's say a company uh, introduces a new sales strategy just in one location, United States, and then wants to find out, hey, how will this sales strategy that I've introduced in one country impact my global operations or global sales? So this is where a concept of synthetic controls is useful because what we need here is we need to be able to control for everything that Sweden has gone through at this point in time, introducing carbon tax and everything else. That could be that, hey, this country, when they introduce this carbon tax, we see gasoline consumption is going down, diesel consumption going up, but that could be for various reasons. It's not could be just carbon tax that's impacting this, this trend, downward trend. It could be that they introduce at right at this point high efficiency vehicles. And so they just don't need as much gasoline. Maybe they need 50% less. And so they, there's a less need. Maybe there was a supply shock, meaning gasoline was started becoming so expensive that people are like, I don't want to consume it. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe diesel became more cheaper. So there could be so many reasons in which you can't just say, hey, we introduce carbon tax right now and, and we can clearly see there's a reduction. So how do, you, how do you then solve for impact of carbon tax on gasoline consumption in Sweden? That's where we create synthetic controls. A synthetic control is basically a statistical method in which you create um, a weighted combination of groups of control. So like, like let's say you didn't introduce gasoline, uh, carbon tax here. So what do you do is you build a synthetic control that looks similar to Sweden's gasoline consumption using all other countries. So you use all other countries and you find out like, hey, what is it? What is, what is the weight that I can use in different countries to mimic Sweden? So you build a mimicking Sweden control, meaning a line that looks like this based on data from other countries. You can say, hey, 10% of United States plus 50% of Norway plus 60%, you know, maybe 40% of Denmark equals Sweden, even before this point in line. So you find out a synthetic control that looks like Sweden using other countries' data. Once you have that synthetic control that mimics Sweden, then you can say, hey, look, that synthetic control has increased gasoline consumption and my after um, and, and, and Sweden actually went through this, let's say this black line, right? Which is after carbon tax. So you can then control this. The, then you can find out the difference between the synthetic control that looks like Sweden because you had actually modeled it exactly like Sweden before the intervention and you compare it with actually Sweden. And then you say, hey, look, this is the actual difference. So that is the role of synthetic control. Similarly, if you, if you add an intervention here, you say, hey, I'm gonna introduce a new sales strategy in United States. And then you model all other country sales such that it looks like United States, right? Because you can create um, a weighted combination of groups used as controls. And then you can then you actually compare that control, the synthetic control with United States actual numbers. You say, hey, that's the impact of this new sales strategy. So these are all techniques, folks, in which you can use past data to still build causal inference out of it. But the biggest takeaway from this is you can only use observational study in conjunction with some experimental evidence that you already have in your business in the past. Because experimentation is the only way to provide unbiased evidence for causal link. So that's the caution. And then finally, ask yourself deeper questions. Like what mechanism could be acting both on my treatment and my response variables? That'll help you design your experiments so much better understand the importance of selecting right controls and you can model for heterogeneity or different 
cohorts, how they are impacted. And that will really make you understand how your business works deeply because without knowing how your business context really works, without knowing deeply how your business context works, you'll not be able to design the right experiment. And without right experiments and right controls, you will not arrive at the right causal link and your data-driven decision will be wrong. So super, super important to remember this caution, to use observational study in conjunction with experimental evidence, ideally with an A-B test. And when you can't, do as much as you can to design your experiments and controls so that you can factor out various impacts. All right, so that's chapter six, controls. I'll see you all in the next chapter. Thanks.